right, welcome back to Panic Butter. Hey, I'm glad you could make it here. This is Tony. Good evening, no matter where you are. I hope you're having a great day. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and join me. We're gonna see some strange, some creepy. Is that real? Part two. What do you think? Here we go. Let's get into it. Are you ready? Why would they want to do this on the eclipse? I have no idea, but this company is super creepy. I'm going to tell you why right now. Now they say this is super safe, but we're talking about protons colliding, the potential of having a big bang, not to mention how weird it is that this is located in the territory of St. Genis Poli in Switzerland. Now in times, this town was dedicated to this thing called a polygon. This is the destroyer of worlds. Now, why is that important? Well, the Hydron Collider could lead us into having a black hole. It may go to somewhere where things can come out our end. What a weird coincidence. If you go on their website, they say they have no intention of causing any harm. Well, what scientist, what person has never had an intention of doing something wrong and oh, accidentally blowing up the world or cracking the space-time continuum. So listen to this quote from the director of research at CERN. Something might come through the dimensional doors at LHC, Large Hadron Collider, and out of this door something might come. Or we may just send something through the door. CERN says it's for research. This is just the facts. What do you think is really going on with this Hadron Collider tested at the same time as the solar eclipse? I would love to see a comment from you. That's crazy. What do you think? What's going to happen? What are their intentions? Whether they're looking for something or they've already found it and they're just trying to reestablish something. I don't know. What do you think? Let me know. It's pretty interesting. It's happening though. Something's going on. Till then, this is what's happening. The story goes that the crew that is investigating the Skinwalker Ranch right now set up a trail cam one night before they went to bed. Well, about an hour after they laid down, all of their phones started going off, each of them getting a notification that something just walked into the trail cam view. Well, they go to check it out, and this is what they see. Now, I don't know about y'all, but this is some of the best imagery I've ever seen of a skinwalker. Absolutely mind-blowing. Check them out. They're lanky, walking on all fours, distorting, mutilated looks like they could have previously been human but something has happened they are known to be shapeshifters as you all know and they're equipped similar to wendigos but not quite the same i'd like you to take a look at their hands long fingers pointy they look like absolute killers could not imagine running into one of these things in the wild not only are they on all fours but they look tall these beings are long and lanky, fast, and they're feral. Now, as you can see, there's two different ones here. Now, I want you to take a closer look at one of them. If you look at this one, right around its waist, it almost looks like it has some sort of harness on it. Take a look behind them. Is it just me, or are there actual other beings behind them? Almost think if they're the handler of these skinwalkers, if they're the ones in charge of them, or they use them as hunters, or whatever it may be, who knows? But if you look closely, I'll zoom in on a pic, you can see there is absolutely some sort of entity behind them. Hmm. Whether it's a shapeshifter or what, I have no idea, but it is the freakiest stuff I've ever seen. I mean, could you imagine walking through the woods? getting ready to go hunting and running into one of these things hearing it screech and scream at you and then hunt you down like an animal absolutely terrifying do not go in the woods without a gun these things are out here man oh yeah imagine that you're out there in the middle of the night creeping around and you see something like that or hear something Does that ever happened to you it's happened to me a couple times something pretty strange knew what it was and it was huge what about you let's see what we got coming up next it's getting pretty good 
Here we go. Okay, are fairies real? Really good question. I'll tell you what happened. The late Richard Shaw, my business partner, and I, we traveled down to Mexico, this is years ago, to interview Jaime Masson. Jaime Masson has one of the longest running television programs in Mexico that deals with the whole UFO phenomenon. He's amazing. He's a great researcher. We were in his office, and Jaime had to go up because he was filming, and he goes, Shaw, Marzuli, look at this. And he opens up the cabinet behind him, and he takes down this, this glass vial like this, and in it is a winged creature with this demonic-looking head and the wings and a stinger tail. And Richard and I are going like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, that was the beginning of us, Richard Shaw and myself, unraveling the hoax, because it was a hoax. No one knew it until we, we looked at the x-rays. The x-rays seemed to be real, because it had uh, buckshot in the pelvis. Someone had shot this thing. I mean, it was, it was a very well-constructed, clever hoax. Uh -huh. but it, was, it, it wasn't until we got the ferry out of Mexico, and then it was in Los Angeles area, actually Agora. There were three veterinarians on a Saturday morning. They all looked at it, we re-x-rayed it. Everyone thought it was real. Every, it fooled everybody. So the thing is laying on this like little plastic tray. And all of a sudden I look down, and you remember it's been out of the formaldehyde for about an hour and a half. So the skin starts to shrink and fall off. And right up here, we found a piece of wood like a matchstick with epoxy on the end of it. Hmm. Once we saw that, we were off to the races. Busted. Three days later, we were at the Santa Barbara History Museum with a taxidermist, a naturalist, and he completely deconstructed the whole thing and showed us how it was made. The moment we found out that it was a hoax, we notified Tom Horn, Skywatch TV, Prophecy Watchers TV. I, I was blogging at that time. We just blasted it out. So, you know, fool me once, right? And that's what it was. And I, I really learned from that because, well, let me put it this way. We actually had a book that came out. And in that book, I said, it's in print, in writing. I said, right now, I believe the fairy is real, but more research has to be done. That's what the research is. So it fooled everybody, fooled us, took a egg on my face, but then we did the due diligence and we got it out of Mexico and we proved it was a fake. Wow. Well, they spent a lot of money. That's what happened. And then they had to justify it. Got to look deeper. If it's incredible and it's so far-fetched, is it real? Usually not. Somebody's just trying to make a buck. Just like there. What about here, though? Let's see. Here we go. Okay, what in the world? Why is China warning its citizens about visiting the United States? Uh -oh. And telling them to be prepared for various unexpected situations? Now, this doesn't seem suspicious at all. So I looked online to find further information and the reason why China is issuing travel advisory to citizens is because they are warning of unwarranted interrogations and harassment. And here's the article, China issued a travel advisory for citizens visiting the United States asking them to take safety precautions and to be prepared for various unexpected situations such as being searched. Several Chinese students and company employees have recently been subjected to unwarranted interrogations and harassment by U.S. airport law enforcement officers, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs said on its WeChat account on Friday. Their phones, computers, and other luggage items were searched piece by piece, and several people were banned from entering the country, it said. So here's my question. Why right now? Why all of a sudden is this happening? Seems like suspicious, coincidental timing to me. You know, with everything else going on in the world, the geopolitical strife and division. But I want to know what you think. Why is this warning coming out now, especially a week before the great American solar eclipse? And we have so much going on with that. Again, that could be something completely unrelated, but I just find it, you know, another coincidence in timing. What do you guys think? With that, I love you all so much. God bless. And remember, the just shall live. Well, it's strange because he's never been to China. They're used to it, though. They get carded all the time. If you go there, so do you. You gotta register in order to stay there. Gotta tell them where you're gonna stay. Not like it is here. Yeah, people are always shocked when they get asked for ID here. Uh, and sometimes it's good. The rest of the time it's not. So, let's move on. A. Marquette posted the following video and writes, we should have listened to the dog and not gone downstairs.
This is what they caught on camera. Uh-oh. Dog knows something. Pay attention. Pay attention. Come on, we're gonna have to go and check. Leave them up here. Come on. Oh yeah, the creepy noise. Shit, it's everywhere. Whoa, whoa! Yeah, that got your attention. That's good. My shoes are upstairs. That's good. Still in the kitchen? Oh, joking. No. Forget the keys, just leave. And take the dog too. Yeah, the dog's the smartest one there. He sees it all, knows it all. Tells you, don't go down there. But they do. And they didn't oil the door. You can't do that in the dark. Especially if you're that creeped out, huh? That'll scare you every single time you do it. Even if there's nothing there. Huh. Where are we going next? Being found in Kist in Russia. It's a warm night in the summer of 1996. Breathing the air in the forest, I heard her voice calling her. She claims she is the scurrying of tiny feet. Saw this crying creature. Take it home, let it take care of it. Go into this room and see this creature. He's still alive. What? It applies immediately in some way. Orenka is beautiful. Tamara Jr. Nothing about the baby seems human. If it isn't human, where do it come from? That's the million dollar question, huh? I'll do negative. We're going to do a histology test. We're going to do a DNA test. At this point, the case begins to contract the attention of the Russian media. As a result, a well-known scientist, Boris Solitov, steps in and offers to conduct the necessity DNA test. Bendlin hands over the body to one of Solitov's assistants. He expects word back without weeks. Months go by and nothing. Then the story takes its strangest twist yet, finally tracked down by Russian TV journalists. Solitov makes this astonishing claim on the journal back to the lab. His assistant sees flashing lights in the sky. Kraft swoops down and blocks the way. Give it back. They showed up, as the UFO says. They brought the essence to the base below. Bendlin suspects that Zolotov may be hiding another terrifying truth, that he was forced to hand over the creation to the Russian Secret Service. Just as the trail seeds were going cold, new lead emerged. Russian investigative journalist and TV reporter Vadim Chernobrov claims to have new. I found a local woman who admitted her true situation. He is hoping that it contains flakes of skin or body fluids from the creation. These could hold DNA. After two weeks, the Moscow lab has its result. 
Here it is. Test identity of two sets of DNA. One of them is female, most certain to be that of Tamara Sr. But it's the sequence of the other set of DNA that is most removable. I'll take it. There are traces of a scientifically unknown creature on the shroud. Stine tried to make a sample. Yeah, that's... I don't know, that's weird. Is that real? Because, uh, you know, the earlier one about the fairy, it wasn't. Both of them are out of this country. I don't know. Kind of out on that one. What about you? What do you think? It looked good, but so did the fairy. I don't know. Here we go. Let's see what this is. To Qatar. It was a completely normal mission for us. We were not alerted for anything abnormal. It was in the middle of a day. Uh, I remember coming into a base in Afghanistan called Bagram. Back in those days, it was pre austere. It was an old Russian air base that we were using. You know, it's basically built in a bowl in the mountains where you have to stay high right up in the last minute and then you basically come screaming back down to, to land. Uh, the area to the side of it was called the Valley of Death because during uh, the Soviet days with the uh, Mujahideen, they had fired the rockets into a lot of the uh, helicopters so you could see all kinds of uh, wrecks and stuff in the valley below. Which, for the most part, I didn't pay attention to because I was a little busy getting an airplane on the ground safely. Uh, we landed and uh, basically was told to taxi to the very end of the tarmac. And like I said, it was middle of day, very hot. Remember that? We opened the doors and unloaded the equipment that we had brought in. Uh, and then we were met at the aircraft by uh, what we later on called the babysitters. But uh, they kind of introduced themselves and said, Hey, no cameras. Uh, nobody's taking pictures here. We're uh, moving some high value stuff. Yeah, it was like the men in black. Uh, when the load got there, uh, we're very, of course, uh, curious to see what it was. Because that's just the way you are when you're told that you're not allowed to have uh, a camera. Uh, they say this thing had been dead for maybe a day or two, uh, but it stunk. When I say stunk, I've smelled dead things before, but this had a more of a, I want to say a musky stink, kind of a, not really a decay decay, but more of a, somebody hadn't taken a shower in like 10 years, type of a musty, uh, musky stink, is all I can tell you. And it was basically a dead guy, and this guy was extremely large. And when I say large, uh... Our pallets are basically, if I remember correctly, about 9 by 12 feet or so. This guy was laying in a fetal position on the pallet. So he, and he filled the pallet. Uh, we estimated his size at it, approximately 12 to 10 feet tall. Uh, I did see a skin color. I was expecting somebody of more Arabic descent, uh, being an Afghanistan general. I know he was dead, but he was very pale, very white. Another thing that uh, us and the rest of the crew did was we took our feet. We, he was in a fetal position, so you could take your feet and put it kind of, you could see where his feet were there, and they were they were wrapped up. He did not have shoes on, but he had like a, looked like he was wrapping them in some kind of a canvas type stuff, but we were sticking our feet up next to his feet, and then his feet were extremely big. But we know that the standard weight on one of those pallets is uh, about 1,500 pounds, and I do remember that the loadmaster did the weights, and it was around 1,100 pound guy. The pallet sits on dunnage. You know what dunnage is? It, it's uh, basically like railroad ties so that you can get a forklift underneath it and pick it up. So it was on dunnage, and basic dunnage is like maybe a 4x4. Four four. And then the pallet is, it's a yay thick. It's actually aluminum with balsa wood. And uh, this guy, I mean, laying down was very, very wide. I mean, and he was, like I said, he's in a fetal position, and you grow up and just, you hit it, and of course he's under a tarp and all that, I understand that, but he was one dense, he was a dense guy. Uh, we questioned the babysitters and, hey, where'd you get this guy? And uh, some of the army guys there with him were uh, relayed to us that uh, this guy had, I guess, been living up in the mountains uh, next to a village where the villagers basically treated him like a god. I did infer that they were uh, making sacrifices to this guy because they said he was, he found bones of people. The giant supposedly, like I said, I was not there, supposedly killed the first team that they came across. He was extremely big and fast and agile for a guy that size. They sent up another team and 
when the second team went under the get him. Supposedly he had already started to basically eat on the team that uh, that been killed the first time. They then grabbed a helicopter and the helicopter brought him down where we picked him up. After we loaded the giant, it was just a standard uh, standard mission back. We took him all the way back to uh, El Yadid in Qatar where he was transloaded onto a another airplane, I believe. It was a C-17. Uh, I was done with my mission then. I got away from him and I was done. I did ask some questions later uh, where it might have gone. And as the grapevine goes, it was probably taken back in the United States. And the words I heard were right pat. But again, I don't know. Wow, that's heavy. No matter how many times you hear it, you know, it always is interesting. Is it real, though? Did it really happen? Chances are it did. With everything that we hear and we find out, we don't know. We'll never see any photos, though. But maybe we can use this and go look. The chronovisor is said to be a device that gives the user the ability to see through time. Though the existence of the chronovisor has never been proven, a 2002 book by Vatican priest, Father Francois Brun, says otherwise. According to Brun, the chronovisor was developed by Father Pellegrino Ernetti, a Benedictine monk. Ernetti allegedly kept the device secret until the early 1960s, when he confided in Brun and told him that 12 scientists, including famed physicist, Enrico Fermi and former Nazi scientist Werner von Braun helped him to build it. Made of cathode rays, antennae, and metals that received sound and light signals on all wavelengths, the chronovisor purportedly allowed the team of scientists to document events of the past, including the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The machine, therefore, could validate the teachings of the Bible simply by providing a first-hand look into the past. Brune explains how he met Father Ernetti on a boat ride across Venice's Grand Canal in the early 1960s. Like Brune, Ernetti was well-versed in the history of ancient languages, which made for natural conversation. But soon, Ernetti directed their chat towards science. Brune had been expounding on the many ways in which the Christian Bible could be interpreted when Ernetti suggested that he had access to the truth via a time-traveling device. Ernetti claimed that he and a group of renowned scientists came together in a mutual quest to uncover the past. One scientist was Fermi, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1938, and another was the ex-Nazi von Braun, whose work at NASA got America to the moon. According to Ernetti, the device had several antennae, three of which were made of mysterious metals that picked up sound and light waves across their entire respective spectrums. A direction finder on the device was allegedly tuned into the specific era one wanted to view, while a screen displayed it and a recording device captured the footage. The chronovisor was thus more of a window into the past than a time machine. Ernetti said it worked like a television, catching echoes from days long gone that had been floating in space. And he claimed to have seen some astonishing things. Ernetti recounted how he witnessed Marcus Tullius Cicero's speech to the Roman Senate in 63 BC. His gestures, his intonation, Ernetti effused, how powerful they were. What flights of oratory. Ernetti made additional, increasingly bolder claims, such as having observed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. From the founding of the Roman Empire to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Ernetti alleged that he and his team had taken a peek into some of the most important events in the Bible. Ernetti maintained until his death in 1994 that the machine had been hidden away by the Vatican in order to safeguard it from falling into the wrong hands. Interestingly, the Vatican decreed in 1988 that anyone using an instrument of such characteristics would be excommunicated. Shortly before he died, Ernetti wrote an open letter adamantly reiterating that the device was real. He claimed that Pope Pius XIV forbade us to disclose any details about this device because the machine was very dangerous. 
it can restrain the freedom of man. Some say that Father Pellegrino Ernetti confessed to having fabricated the whole story before his death on April 8, 1994, but this remains hotly contested. With von Braun, Fermi, Ernetti, and Brune now dead, only the intriguing mystery remains. Yeah, I'll take one. Where do I get it? How do I use it? And then, what would you do with yours? Yeah, that's what we want to know. If you made it this far, thanks for showing up. Join us next time. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notifications. Turn them on. That way, you'll be right back here with us. We'll catch up with you. Have a good evening.